Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. And thank you for being here at church, Southern Hills. We're so glad that you could be here today. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16 is our text as we continue the sermon series, The Happy Thief. The, the sermon today, I think, can be a help to a lot of people. But I have to begin by asking a question. How many of you uh, ever been to uh, a little theme park down in Southern California called Disneyland? Anybody been there before? Raise your hand if you've been there. What's your favorite ride at Disneyland? Somebody, what is your fa- yeah, what is your favorite ride? Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. Indiana, it's an incredible ride. Indiana Jones and the Temple of, of Scary Cars or whatever it's called, right? It's a great ride, one of the best. I think you love it the best because of the... Harrison Ford, maybe that's why. A lot of ladies love that ride for that reason alone. Somebody else, what, what, yes, in the back, what is it? Space Mountain. Space Mountain, which is a ride that you enjoy until it breaks your neck. It just is so, I, last time I rode on Space Mountain, I, I realized this is why they keep it in the dark. It's very scary, it can be a lot. Well, somebody else, favorite ride, favorite ride, yes. Guardians of the Galaxy, that's right. It goes up and down. And you ride this ride? How old are you? Nine. Ladies and gentlemen, she's nine years old and she likes the scariest ride at Disney. Give her a round of applause. This woman is, young lady is. I like Pirates of the Caribbean because I'm old school. I do a lot. Oh, there we go. Very good. Pirates of the Caribbean, I love it. It's a lot of fun because as a child, you can ride it and you can learn so many life principles. Like, the heroes of the ride are those who, you know, pillage and plunder and thief and steal, get drunk and sell people. It's a great ride. And I, you don't really realize this until you're like a teenager. You're going through and you're like, man, these guys are awesome. Pirates life for me. And you're like, actually, they're the bad guys. And they are the bad guys. They're very, very bad people. But we don't think of pirates in that way until we're the one being robbed, thieved, pillaged, plundered, or stolen against. So today, the sermon is entitled Progress Pirate, the seventh villain, Progress Pirate, the seventh villain in this sermon series. And the seventh villain doesn't want you to see how far you've come. The seventh villain, as we study through the book of Philippians, the Progress Pirate, he steals joy, he thieves you from your happiness, by attempting, you, attempting to make you forget how far you've already, how far you've already come. I would drive my kids to Disney a lot growing up uh, with the kids really small. Now they're getting so old. And, and we would put them in the car Sunday nights after church. We would spend the whole day at church, put them in the car and drive to Anaheim. And as we would drive these little children um, all the way, four hours to Disney, um, we would hear the same question every single time we drove. It was the same question, and it's probably the same question that your children ask you every time you get in the car to go from one place to another. In the middle of it, in the back of the car, they shout out the same question. What is the question they ask? Are we there yet? And I don't know where they learn this question. I don't know if there's like a class in school that they sit them down and say, this is how to bother your parents. You ask the same question, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And and I was fine on the drives most of the time until they were not fine and began asking the question, are we there yet? And it bothered me so much. The only thing that would get me through it is being able to look at the mile markers and think we're, um, we're one mile closer we're one mile closer. And those mile markers became my friends that showed me how far we've already come. I find that many Christians in their life lack joy, they lack happiness on a daily basis because they're not very good at tracking how far they've already come. They're either obsessed with how far they still have to go or obsessed about where they came from that they cannot appreciate the journey because they cannot see the progress they've already made. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking to the Philippians about in Philippians chapter 3. 
Paul, in the previous verses, began to give his religious resume. All the things that he had done well, all the places that he had been, and how he was pursuing Jesus Christ. But as he arrives in verses 12 through 16, his point is to encourage the Philippians that though Paul had already gone a long way, Paul had not already arrived. And to focus on the progress that he had made and focus on the progress that we are making. In fact, that's the big idea for today's very short and simple sermon. The big thought is steady progress fuels the heart. Say it with me. Steady progress fuels the heart. Say it again. Say it again. Steady progress fuels the heart. Today's service is going to be very different if you're new to church, if you're new to even been part of this church for a while. It's going to be different in that this sermon is going to be very very, very simple. And not only is it going to be very simple, it's going to be followed by a time of worship and prayer and a time of scripture reading so that the simple message that I share with you really sinks deeply into your heart and soul. If you're ready for it today, I want to get an amen. Steady progress fuels the heart. What is the secret? to steady and daily progress? Well, there are three found in this passage, three that I want to point out. The first one of the three comes in verse 12, and that is honesty. Say it with me, honesty. See, you need an honest evaluation of your current progress. Look at verse 12. Not that I have already attained. Paul is being honest about his progress. Not that I had already attained or am already perfected, but I do press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has laid hold of, me. Honesty. Say honesty. Honesty. It's not always easy to be honest. In fact, I find it's actually easier to be honest with others more than it's easy to be honest with ourselves especially as we evaluate where we're at in life. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about honesty. Um, Let's be honest with each other. I'm gonna ask some questions. You raise your hand. I want you to be honest. Don't lie. This is church. How many of you believe it's wrong to lie? Amen, right? Okay. Some of you aren't sure. How many of you believe it's especially wrong to lie in church? Would you say amen, right? Okay, don't lie. All right, so we're gonna ask some questions. You gotta be honest. How many of you like Josh? You're like me. You're like I am. You love, you love Taco Bell. How many of you love? Don't don't say it if it's not true. Don't raise your hand. But if you do, it's time. We don't do confessional booze. We do it all together. Everybody together. Already? Okay. How many of you love Taco Bell? Be honest. Raise your hand. How many of you love Taco Bell? All right. Very good. Okay. Raise your hand. Some of you are so ashamed. You're like, oh, dear God. (laughs) How many of you love Taco? Raise your hand. How many of you are like that? Okay. Look at you. Look at you. About 50% of you. Very good. Rick, keep your hand high. Come on, be proud of your sin. Get it up there, all right? You love Taco Bell, but how many of you also agree Taco Bell is not good for you? How many of you also, you know it's not good for you, but you still love it? Raise your hand. Look at that. Bunch of contradictive people here. We know it's not good for us, but we still love it. That's honesty. My wife, uh, Heather, and daughter, Scarlett, we had spent a very long day at church, very long day. This was, I don't know, a month or two ago. All day here, busy, doing all sorts of stuff, and then late at night on the way home from Ascent to youth group, the youth group meets here every Sunday night from 6 to 8, and so they're on their way home, and they're just tired. They didn't want to go home and cook anything, so they stopped by Taco Bell. Late at night, Taco Bell moment. You've been there. You know, and, and they pulled in, and as they pulled in, they ordered their tacos and their chalupas. <laughs> The gorditas. And as they pulled up, this never happened before. The man handed the bag of tacos or whatever it was to them. And the man looked at them and said these words, you know, you really should not be eating these kind of food. <laughs> That's what the Taco, Be- the Taco Bell guy said that. How many of you agree? That's corporate honesty to a fault, right? Like, what are you doing? Like, you're training your employees not to eat this kind of stuff. Paul says, I want you to be honest, but I want you to get honest about yourself. About yourself. Judgmental pride makes us want to be honest about you. This is where you're wrong. And he says, no, let's be honest about ourselves. And Paul gets honest about himself and his progress. And he says in verse 12, he says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. 
It's not that I think I've arrived. I'm not yet perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I know I haven't yet arrived at perfection. I'm not exactly like Jesus yet. But he goes on. But I do press on. I do move forward that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. What is he saying? He's saying, I haven't arrived, but Jesus has arrived. I haven't arrived at perfection, but Jesus has arrived at perfection. And my goal is not to arrive at perfection as a Christian. My goal is to arrive and grasp Jesus. My goal is not to apprehend perfection. My goal is to apprehend Jesus. And when I get Jesus, he will get me and I will get him. That's my goal. And so many Christians, what we often do is we spend our lives focused on perfection when in fact we will never arrive at perfection until we arrive at apprehending Jesus. I talk to Christians about this all the time. And I talk to unbelievers about this all the time. I say, don't try to come to Jesus so that Jesus gives you all the things you've always wanted. Don't try to arrive at him so that he can bless you with all perfection. Instead, first realize he has already arrived at perfection for you. Your goal is to get to Jesus, not to get to these other things. And so what is he saying here? He's saying, not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I do press on. I move forward. I focus on the perfection that he has already arrived at. Be honest. Honesty is hard for us today because we think the image is everything, and so we've got to project a certain image to our, our friends, and we have to project a, a certain image to society. And now that I'm a Christian and I go to church, I have to project a certain image to the church people, lest they think that I'm not as good as they are. And, and I want to make sure that I project a certain image to my children and project a certain image to my parents and project a certain image to the world around me. And social media, this really helps because I'm going to post all the best photographs. I'm going to take 75 and I'm going to pick one. I'm going to filter it. It doesn't even look like me. And that's who I am. This is the person who I am. I'm gonna post the highlight reel of my life so that others begin to wish they were me even though I secretly wish I were them. And we're not honest with ourselves. Hmm. <laughs> this happens even when it comes to the products we purchase. Why don't we try to impress everybody? I, um, I'm at the age Okay, we're being honest. Somebody raise your hand and tell me. Give me an amen if this is you. I'm at the age where I'm starting to trim hairs from the most surprising places. <laughs> like I look in the mirror and I used to shave my face and now I have to shave in my face. <laughs> Anybody else doing this? I'm 41 and I don't know what it was about four or five years ago, just, just like, like a forest growing out of my nose. And I'm at the point, I'm at the point where it's growing, but I'm not at the point in my life where I've given up. You know those guys? They're at the point where they're like, it's just there, and you talk to them, and you're just looking at their nose. Because it's just too much, you know? And they're like, it's a filter. I don't even need a mask because all the... <laughs> they're like, there's no coronavirus getting through that maze. And so I'm, I'm trimming, I'm, I'm, and it's just bad. And then I realized my daughter looked over and she said, what is in your ear? And I'm like, oh, earwax, like, I'm, like, like forever. And it's not, there is trees growing. And I'm like, oh, man. And so I went on Amazon and I bought a product, a, a nose hair trimmer. And I wanted the best, you know, the ones with like four and a half stars rated by like 70,000 people. They're like, this is the best nose hair trimmer in the world. You need this one. The other ones are trash. Best nose hair trimmer. And I love Amazon because you order from Amazon and like every week is Christmas because you show up at the house and you're like, oh, there's a package. Who is it for? It's for me. And they make the opening of the package an experience now. You don't buy products. Now you buy experiences. Steve Jobs made this happen because you don't buy a phone. You now buy a, a package and you open it up. You know what I mean? Have you ever opened up an electronic passage now? You open it up, 
and it's like, <laughs> put it aside, and there's like music coming, hallelujah, you know? It's a whole thing. It's a, there, did you know there are YouTube channels dedicated to watching people open packages? It's called unboxing. It's unboxing. They unbox things, and people watch. Your children, watch this. What is wrong with your children? So I get my nose hair trimmer from Amazon, and it's in a box like it's an Apple product. And I'm not kidding. It, it's a whole thing. I know, I know that the box costs more than the nose trimmer inside, but you open it up, and there's like, it, there's, there's foam, you pull the foam off, and there's like a black velvet cloth so that you can display your nose hair trimmer. It's a nose hair trimmer, people. This is not a joke. There were window decals. They sent me stickers for my hydro flask so that I can show people which nose hair trimmer I prefer. This is where our society is. We are so obsessed with image that we want to completely convince others we're in a place that we actually aren't, or we want to convince ourselves we're in a place that we're actually not. And so Paul begins by blowing everyone's mind with a level of authenticity and genuineness that is reserved only for those who are most humble. And he states very clearly, I'm the apostle Paul. Look at all the things I've done. He points to verses 1 through 11 of Philippians chapter 3. This is my religious resume. But let me be honest with you. I have not already attained. I am not already perfected. L let, me, let me share the similar honesty with you. I'm not your apostle. I'm your pastor. I, Josh Tice, I have not attained perfection. I have not arrived at the place of Jesus yet. I have not been there. I am not even close. But along with the apostle Paul, I can say, but I do press on. I too keep going forward. I don't give up even though I fall. I don't give up even though I make a mistake. I don't stop even though I know I'm not there yet. And yes, I've gone. I have a long way to go. But I gotta tell you, I've already come a long way. And so have you. So he says, but I press on. Why? So that I, lay, that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has already laid hold of for me. What does that mean? It means Jesus Christ has already arrived at perfection. All you need to do is arrive at Jesus. Pursue Jesus. The first word that we've got to get through when it comes to understanding the secret to steady and daily progress, number one, is the word honesty. Say it with me. Honesty. Number two, number two, focus. Say it with me. Focus. You haven't arrived. You haven't arrived. Listen, my friend. You have not arrived, but you are moving forward. Look at how far you've come in the last 12 months. Now, focus on where you're going. Verse 13. Brethren, again, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I do not believe that I've already arrived at perfection. Anybody here have arrived at perfection? Anybody? We'll give you a chance a little bit later. Think about it. If you're like, yeah, I think I'm better than the rest, uh, I want to give a testimony about it. I'll give you a moment. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead. The next five minutes can be absolutely life-changing from some of you for those who grasp this for the very first time. We all have a past. Every single one of us have a past. None of us have arrived at the level of perfection. Not yet. We're still in the process, progress. Now, I want to give pure opportunity because I feel like this needs to be a democratic process. If anybody here says, Pastor Josh, I think I have arrived. I am better than everybody else, pretty close to Jesus. I have arrived. I want to give you an opportunity to stand right now and talk about how you're better than the rest of us in the room. Anybody real quick would like to, you know, go ahead. This is your moment. 
No, I mean, we're even in church. Nobody wants to take advantage of this opportunity. Here's why, because if you're new here to church, let me be very clear. Christians don't believe they are perfect. In fact, quite often we believe exactly the opposite. We know we have so far to go to get to the level of perfection that is Jesus Christ. We spend most of our time so worried and focused on the past mistakes we've made. Paul said, you'll never move forward if you're focused on the past. This one thing I do, forget the things which are behind. Forget the things which are behind. Forget the things which are behind. Listen, some of us in this room need to forget some relationships that are now in the past. Some of us in this room need to forget some, some businesses that are now in the past. Some of us in this room need to forget some grades that are now in the past. Some of us in this room need to forget some, some failures that are in the past. Every single one of us in this room have things in the past we need to let go of. Paul did, and so do we. For example, some of us have some great things we did in the past, some really good things, like the apostle Paul talked about in verses one through 11. Let me tell you about my past. I've done some amazing things. The problem is you need to forget your past because you're living in the past. It's like the guy who peaked in high school and all he can ever do in the age of his 40s is talk about how great he was as a junior or a senior in high school. It's time to move forward. Some of us have done some great things in the past, but you're not going to do great things in the future because all you can do is focus on the past. It's time to focus on the future. Some of us are not focused on the past because of the great things we accomplished. Some of us are focused on the past because of the great mistakes that we've made. Every time you try to move forward in your life, the devil says to you, you can't move forward. You know who you are. I know who you are too. You did this to that person and you broke that person's heart and you hurt that person and this is who you are. And, still, and so instead of allowing the blood of Christ to forgive you and cleanse you of those sins and move forward from the past, you are stuck there and the devil keeps pulling you back in this direction when you're attempting to move this way. Your past is in the past. Say it with me. My past is in the past. Say it with me. My past is in the past. The apostle Paul knew exactly what he was talking about. He fights the same enemy that you do, the progress pirate who tries to keep you where you're at by telling you you can't move forward because of what you've done in the past. You understand the apostle Paul's past? The apostle Paul was a persecutor of the church. Do you know what that means? Practically, it means this. It means he was one of the guys who would break into a church that was having service like this. He was a, an official, religious, and political official who could come into a church and arrest people for going to church. That used to be a shocking thing. Arrest people for going to church. When I say that, go, <gasps> arrest people for going to church. I know. Don't you agree it's not right to just arrest people for practicing their religion? How many of you agree with me you should not arrest people for practicing their religion? Can I get an amen? amen. Now, some of us are like, because of what's happened in the last couple of years, some of us have been twisted in our mind. Some of us think, oh, there, are, there are certain circumstances you should arrest people for practicing their religion. Listen to me. I love you. You're screwed up in your head. There is never a reason... You should arrest somebody for simply practicing their faith freely. But the Apostle Paul, he was the guy who would go in to church services and he would arrest deacons and pastors and church people, take them and throw them into prison and to the point of actually executing them under state law and religious law. That's who Paul was. If Paul spent his entire life obsessed with the mistakes he made in the past, Paul knew he would never move forward. This is my concern for some of us. My concern for some of us in this room is that we have a very difficult time moving forward because we're so focused on the good things we've done. Number two, some of us move, can't move forward because we're focused on the bad things we've done. Others can't move forward because they're focused on the bad things that happened to them in the past. It's not that you did something bad, it was that something bad was done to you. You're like me, you know what it is to experience hate and abuse. 
And so many times when you attempt to have joy in your life and move forward in your life, it's like the devil whispers in your ear, you can't move forward and have joy and faith and happiness because of what happened to you in the past. And you're allowing this past circumstance to anchor you from moving forward. There's freedom from that. Practically, can I just say this? It's not as easy as some might think. Listen to me. Some of you might think to yourself, well, these people just need to get over it and move forward. No, 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 it's not so easy. In fact, I want to throw this out to some of you who are genuinely anchored to the past because of something that happened to you. You actually may need some good counseling. I, I used to make this mistake all the time. All you need to do is get on your knees and pray 10 minutes a day and you'll forget everything from the past. It's not true. Some of you may need to seek some true counseling. This is one of the reasons why the church is here. Did you know that we offer counseling? We, we call it short-term, solution-based, biblical counseling. That's what it's called. Short-term, solution-based, biblical counseling. Because you're members of the church, and many of you are interested in that, I'll explain so you understand what we offer. It's open to any single member of the church. Short-term, meaning that we only meet with somebody a pastor or a deacon, if you call into the church, anybody can call into the church and say, I need counseling. When you do, they have you fill out a form. When you fill out the form, they'll promise short term. That means one, two, or three sessions. That's it. We don't do long uh, engaged counseling at Southern Hills. We're not equipped to do it. Short term, one, two, or three weeks. Solution-based, which means we're looking for a solution to a specific problem. That's all we know how to do here. Biblical counseling, the only thing we're going to do is show you what the Bible says about your problem or issue. Short-term solution-based biblical counseling, you'll be given to a pastor or a deacon. And a lot of times, we're able to help with a lot of issues that way. You say, what happens after that third week? Well, then what the pastors and deacons do is we refer you to a Christian counseling center in Las Vegas called Renewing Life Center where they have licensed therapists and family counselors and psychologists and psychiatrists who have a biblical Christian worldview and can take you from what we can do to help you even further. And what I'm bluntly saying is some of you have a very difficult time, some of us have a very difficult time moving from the past because of what anchors us there because of a hurt. Some of us have a hard time moving from the past because of something we've done to others. And some of us have a hard time moving from the past because of the greatness we once were. And to all of these things, the Apostle Paul is saying this one phrase, focus. Stop focusing on the past and start focusing on Jesus. And he's the one who will bring you into your future. What do we see, Pastor? Number one, the first secret is honesty. Say honesty. honesty. Number two, second secret is focus. Say focus. Then number three, third secret is effort. Say effort. Say effort. effort. Say, what do you mean effort? I love where the Apostle Paul goes with this. Look at verses 12, 13, and 14. I'll read it together so it leads up beautifully to the excitement of verse 14. It says, not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold for that which is Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting these things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead, verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He, he, it's like he's talking about a great, uh, um, a great Olympic race. And he's saying, I'm running as hard as I can and I can see the finish line out in front. And just as you can picture and imagine in your mind a great marathon or, or a great sprinter as they're running down the track and they see that line in front of them and they stick out their chest and they lean forward just to arrive at the mark. Paul says, that's exactly where I'm at. I press forward. I lean in on where God is leading me. This is what I want for you. I want you to lean in on where God is leading you. I am so thankful for the grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared to every single one of us. By God's grace, we are saved. Aren't you thankful that Jesus Christ saved you? Can I get an amen? 
Aren't you thankful that he died upon the cross? You didn't have to die upon the cross. You didn't have to get buried. You didn't have to raise from the grave. You were the one that were saved by God's grace. Amen. God saved you. And he's the one who is bringing you from your past into perfection. He's the one who does all of that. But here in this passage, the apostle Paul says, I press toward the mark. I press toward the prize. It expended effort is shown. It means that we have a responsibility in the race to show effort to go and lean in the direction that God is leading us. It takes effort. It takes effort to get up on Sunday and go to church. This is why a lot of people who say they believe in Christ don't go to church. They don't want to expend the effort. It takes effort to get up in the morning and read your Bible. This is why a lot of Christians don't read their Bible, because it's expended effort. It takes effort to get on your knees. Oh, man, it takes effort to get on your knees in the morning before looking at your phone and get on your knees and say, Jesus, I just want to talk to you. God, before I go to the world for my answers, I'm coming to you. I'm asking you to help me. Prayer takes effort. This is why many Christians don't pray. This is why many Christians don't read their Bible. This is why many Christians don't move forward in their Christian life. Effort. And then I'm incredibly inspired by those that I see constantly put effort in. Last Sunday um, was Time Change Sunday. Does anybody in this room have a magical device that automatically updates the time change? Anybody have a phone that was made in the last, I don't know, 20 years? Uh, somebody raise your hand if that's you. How many of you, your phone automatically updates, right, your, the time? How many of you, even though the phone automatically updates, is this true of you? You still have a problem with time change. Every time it comes, you're like, oh, man, I forgot it was. Anybody like that? Raise your hand. Be on. We, we're this all about honesty. Okay, a few of us, all right. Happens every single time. Every, as a pastor, this is what's interesting. In a church setting, time change always happens early, like 2 o'clock on Sunday morning. And in the fall, it's the good one. That's where you get an extra hour of sleep and people show up an extra hour early. In the spring, that's when everybody wakes up and forgets the church and they, they show up an hour late. Happens every single time, even though we're years into this now. Now, now, happened last week. Anybody, by the way, anybody here say, Pastor, it happened to me last week? Anybody bold enough to raise their hand and say, okay, there's one guy in the back. <laughs> What's up, Jack? <laughs> His name's actually Jack. Anyway, um, this happened, this poor person last week, they came into church, and, and Pastor Andrew was here, what, at like 7 o'clock, 645, and he's getting stuff ready. By the way, Pastor Andrew and Carrie, they lead our Kidopolis children's ministry. Let's give them a round of applause. We're thankful for them. We love you guys. And and what the Kidopolis program is, is while I'm in here on Sundays babysitting you, they're up there teaching children doctrine. That's true. And I come in here, tell you funny stories while we indoctrinate your children on the ways of Christianity. <laughs> By the way, that's our job. That's our job. It's great. It's a lot of fun. And they lead that in an incredible way. Pastor Andrew does this across the way uh, at the school because we've run out of space here for our kids. So we rent the school next door, and it's a great, great opportunity. And so he was over there early in the morning on Sunday, and he's, he's setting up the booths, and he's putting out all the candy and setting up the story time. And some guy shows up at 7 o'clock in the morning. He's like walking around. There's like nobody at church. Showed up at church. Nobody was here. Here. Worst nightmare. Pastor Andrew said, can I help you? He's like, yeah, where is everybody? Pastor Andrew said, the rapture happened. <laughs> Just kidding. That would be awesome, right? That would be so messed up. He's like, but I've got a plan, you know? <laughs> the guy's like, so what are you doing? He's like, I'm setting up for a kid's church, um, Kidopolis, kid's church. Uh, so, you know, church will start in about an hour and a half. The guy's like, okay. Kind of walking around. And he called out, he said, hey, Pastor Andrew, do you need some help? Now, Andrew's over there carrying like 16 chairs, you know what I mean? He's like, yeah, maybe. And then this guy started helping setting things up. After he's finished setting up some chairs, he said, well, I'm done with that. Do you have anything else? And Andrew's like, yeah, sure, you can actually help with this. And had him help with the snacks or something, another thing, another thing. And after about 20 minutes, the guy said, you know what, Pastor Andrew? He said, I think God is doing something. 
He said, I think God brought me today because I've been coming to this church for many, many years, and I don't really help in a lot of ways. He said, I think I'm going to come here every Sunday at 7 o'clock and help you set up. I love it. I love it. Now, that sounds awesome right now. Probably said, found, sounded awesome as he said it to himself. And then he said it out loud. And then he drove home that day and he's like, oh, dear Lord. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you ever done this, right? And here's why. Because you know to actually do what God is calling you to do is going to take effort. It's going to take effort. It doesn't just happen. I think about the choir that comes in and sings and the band. You know, if you sing in a normal church choir or in the band, normally you come to like a Thursday night practice for an hour and a half and then you show up to church for about an hour and then you're done. That's your whole week because it's volunteer based. Did you know that our, because we have so many people coming to the church and we can't fit everybody in one service and all this, that the, the band and the praise team and the choir, they come and they practice on Thursdays and then they come here on Sunday morning, many of them at 7.30, 50, 8 o'clock, and they stay all the way till noon. They stay all the way through all three services so that everybody else can come and pick the time that's best for them and go home. That is a huge, huge commitment. What are these people doing? They are expending effort as they press toward the mark. When we signed up people for discipleship last month, there are all these people that signed up for discipleship to disciple others, and it was totally inspiring. We had over 100 Christians who signed up to disciple somebody in 2000, uh, 2022 next year. And when the man, Steve, was up here talking about it, he said, now this is a huge commitment. We're talking about 12 months of your life pouring into someone else. And when he said that, I'm sitting back thinking, I don't know how many of these people are going to actually sign up to do this. That's a huge commitment. But what I noticed is nearly every single one of them leaned into it and said, let's do this thing. I've been inspired over and over and over like the Apostle Paul with, was with the Philippians. I am with this church of those who are saying, I'm willing to lean in and show effort to help people. I, I look at the uh, uh, Jeffrey and Nydia over here. Jeffrey and Nydia serve in the Ascent Youth Ministry. Now, the Ascent Youth Ministry is ages 12 to 18, and you guys just had a big party on Friday night, right? When did it start? 6 p.m. on uh, Friday night. And when did it end? 7 a.m. Saturday. That's a 13-hour overnighter, correct? And you guys were here for the whole thing, taking care of the kids, having fun telling them about Jesus. How many of you are glad you do not work in the youth ministry? Can I get an amen right here? How many? <laughs> but praise God for the Ascent youth workers who are here to teach them about Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? It takes effort. And so if you're sitting there saying, Pastor Josh, I got to tell you, man, I got to tell you, I don't know what's wrong. I don't know, man. I, 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 feel like, I feel like I just don't have any progress in my life. It could be that you're not having any progress because you're not honest about how far you've come or how far you need to go. It could be that you have no joy in your life as it relates to progress because in reality, you're not expending effort to move forward. Paul said, I press toward the mark. I know I can't arrive at perfection, but I can arrive at Jesus, and Jesus has already obtained perfection for me. Some of us just need to focus on that. Now, I end with this. I believe the villain is gaslighting a lot of you. Making you think you've not come as far as you already have come. And convincing many of you to turn back way, way too soon. Charles Lindbergh, familiar with Lindbergh, right? Charles Lindbergh was the first to fly solo over the uh, Atlantic Ocean, right? Came from Great Britain all the way to the United States, or was it France? One of the two. 
came all the way over in the spirit of St. Louis, flew over the entirety of the thing. Is the first. I mean, can you imagine? That's an insane thing to be the first to fly over the Atlantic. And it's stated about his journey and has been quoted about his journey that in an interview he said this. When he was first taking off from Europe to fly to the United States in that tiny little plane over that great ocean, he kept hearing a voice over and over and over in his mind. You're a fool, Charles. You're a fool. You're a fool. You're a fool, Charles. Turn back. Turn back. You're a fool, Charles. You're a fool. You're a fool. You're a fool, Charles. Turn back. Turn back. He said, but suddenly, without any ability to chart the ocean, he knew when he was at the halfway point because the internal voice changed. And the internal voice kept saying, you would be a fool to turn back now, Charles. Keep going. You'd be a fool to turn back now, Charles. Keep going. You're almost there, Charles. Keep going. You'd be a fool to turn back now, Charles. Keep going. What I'm saying to every single one of us in this room is you'd be a fool to turn back now. You've already made so much progress. You are not the same person you were six months ago, 12 months ago, five years ago. You are moving forward. Just focus on Christ and have effort to lean in on where he's leading you. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. Lord Jesus, we need this truth in our lives because so many of us, We've had the joy stolen right out from underneath us. And I pray that you would restore joy in our lives today as we make a recommitment to focusing on that progress. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world.